Hi, everybody. We're going to start our next session. I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Professor John P. O'Callaghan, who is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and the director of the Jacques Maritain Center at the University of Notre Dame. Before joining the Notre Dame faculty in 2003, he taught philosophy at Creighton University and at the University of Portland. Professor O'Callaghan earned a degree in mathematics and worked for two years in Boston as an engineer before returning to Notre Dame in 1986 to pursue doctoral studies in philosophy, and he earned his PhD in 1996. Professor O'Callaghan specializes in medieval philosophy, Thomas Aquinas, and Thomistic metaphysics. In addition to numerous articles and reviews, he is the author of Thomist Realism and the, ling the Linguistic Turn Toward a More Perfect Form of Existence, Notre Dame Press, and the Bloomsbury Companion to Aquinas, co-authored with John Haldane, currently in progress. He was appointed as a permanent member to the Pontifical Council of St. Thomas Aquinas in 2010 and served as the president of the American Philosophical Association from 2012 to 2013. For the past several years, his research interests have focused on the virtue of misericordiae in St. Thomas Aquinas and its relevance for contemporary philosophical thought, making him our very own Johannine forerunner to Pope Francis's Declaration of the Year of Mercy. His lecture this morning, Are There Failed Persons?, takes up questions of disability and mercy. Please join me in welcoming John O'Callaghan. Uh, allow me to thank um, the Institute for Church Life, Jessica and John Cavadini, for this wonderful, uh, including me in this wonderful um, conference. Um, it's been a delight to listen to everyone. Um, I do like to think that it isn't the Pope who jumped, or sorry, I didn't jump on the Pope's bandwagon. He jumped on mine because I was working on mercy three years uh, before he was elevated to the papacy. But it turns out his concern with mercy goes all the way back to his youth, which is a little bit older than I am even. I think the interest, and I'm going to read fast because I did, I promise you, cut as much as I possibly could. So I'm going to read faster than I normally would. I think interest in the concept of human dignity, both among those who promote it and among those philosophers and essayists interested in jettisoning it, is driven by the way in which it is caught up in the web of questions we have about the moral obligations and responsibilities we have toward other human beings and what obligations and responsibilities they may have toward us. For Christians, of course, the concept of dignity is caught up in the web of questions we have about what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. In practice, however, I think it functions as a purely negative concept. Dignity is what we invoke when we want to say that you can't kill or abuse someone in various ways. Here I'd like to to try to provide a more positive account of dignity. What drives my interest is failed persons, and in sorry, what drives my interest in failed persons and dignity is the way in which the term person is often used in contemporary philosophy in relationship to disability, particularly cognitive disability, or better, impairment. Used in both metaphysical contexts of asking what it is to be a person and perhaps more importantly, in moral and political contexts of asking questions about who counts as persons for our moral and political concern. We philosophers, focusing upon the nature of a definition, may not recognize how the abstract character of the definition can hide from us the concrete reality defined. I think a good methodological procedure for getting at the reality we try to express with the concept person is to consider what might be thought to fail to live up to the definition of we propose and why. Within contemporary philosophy, the notion of person is often associated with notions of dignity. Among those who still take the notion of dignity seriously, it is thought that it is important to get straight what a person is, the metaphysics of personhood, so that we can determine which individuals amongst us 
uh, have the dignity of a person with its attendant rights and obligations upon us, as well as toward us, a kind of metaphysics of morals, if you will. So getting straight on the metaphysical question of personhood is thought by some to be a crucial precursor to getting straight on the ethical and political questions concerning dignity. On the metaphysical side, person is often thought to mark out beings that exhibit significant cognitive capacities for reason and desire related to reason, what would traditionally have been called capacities for intellect and will. Perhaps the notion of person may be stretched to beings that exhibit significant cognitive-like capacities approximating reason and will. So a preliminary definition of person as deployed within contemporary philosophy might be, a person is a being that exhibits significant capacities for reason and will. Notice that the definition says nothing about being human. If Coco the chimpanzee and Flipper the dolphin exhibit significant cognitive capacities or cognitive-like capacities, then they are persons. And given the way some people think about angels and God, they too would count as persons in the very same way human beings count as persons, if the latter count as persons at all. So if dignity attends the notion of personhood, there's nothing particularly human about the dignity. Considering just human beings, there are human beings that do not appear to exhibit significant capacities of reason and will. Think of very young human beings, for example. But consider also human beings who suffer from some significant cognitive impairments, either from before or after birth, as well as those through some, who, through some injury in life, lose the significant capacity to exhibit reason. Or those very old human beings who simply through the process of aging lose the capacity to exhibit reason in any significant sense. There are lots of human beings amongst us uh, about whom it is at least ambiguous to say that they can exhibit significant cognitive capacities for expressing we reason and will. In that case, they are human beings who are not persons according to the definition and do not have the dignity that attends being a person, as uh, Professor Sneed said earlier this morning. If our moral and political obligations follow upon the dignity of the beings under consideration, these human beings are not subject to the sorts of moral and political obligations we bear towards individuals with the dignity of being persons. What I want to focus upon in this sense of person is the thought that being a person is something that happens to a human being. It's a characteristic a human being can gain and a characteristic a human being can lose. For moral and political reflection on this account, one isn't particularly interested in why becoming a person or ceasing to be a person happens to a being, it simply does. Here there's no account of failed persons. One simply is a person or one isn't because one simply can exhibit in significant ways reason and will or one cannot. I think this account of what it is to be a person, however sketchy for the purposes of this talk, is inadequate. Its inadequacy begins to appear with our recognition that we generally think we have moral and political obligations to an awful lot of the human beings who do not count as persons according to the definition. At the very least, we think we have moral and political obligations towards very young children who are born healthy and not with significant cognitive impairments but who, in their weakness and vulnerability, have not yet reached the stage of development in which significant ca capacities for reason and will can be manifested. Consider, however, that we all know why healthy children come to manifest significant cognitive capacities, because that is the stage of development of being human that they enter into at a particular time. The manifestation of significant cognitive capacities arises in them because of what they already are human beings. We also know why many elderly people no longer manifest the significant capa cognitive capacities they once did, because that is a stage of development of being human that many human beings enter into at a particular time because they are human. We also know why some human beings suffer from cognitive impairments, because given the kind of beings they are, a, a human animal, they ought to go into or be in that stage of development, but for some reason they have not and maybe will not. Knowing what we know about human beings, we seek explanations that help us understand these impairments, explanations typically in terms of underlying physiological 
psychological, or social conditions that affect human development. If we did not have expectations based upon what it is to be a human being, we couldn't make sense of the notions of impairment or injury applied to them, or to any other human being. Let me be clear. The question here is not whether these individuals are human beings, given the impairments. The judgment that these are impairments presupposes the fact of their being human. What they are, human beings, is the precondition for acknowledging the failure to exhibit significant cognitive capacities for reason and will because of what has happened to them as human beings. None of this is mysterious from the perspective of scientifically informed thinking involving biological, psychological, and social scientific perspectives. But the definition of person we are presently considering effectively divorces the moral and political questions from judgments about what it is to be human by driving a metaphysical wedge in between being human and being a person. The definition gives us necessary and sufficient conditions for being a person. However, necessary and sufficient conditions bespeak logical relations, not biological, psychological, and social relations or causes. Questions of human biological, psychological, and social development are opaque to the moral and political reflection that kicks in only in the face of the logically necessary and su sufficient conditions. For the contemporary metaphysics of morals, that the manifestation of such capacities is the ordinary and expected stage of development of an individual member of a certain kind is of interest only for answering the non-moral, practical question at what rough time can we expect to begin to extend the robust moral obligations we extend to one another to them and expect such from them? I said that there are no failed persons on this present account. On the other hand, if we take human development into account, it is clear on this contemporary account that a human being can fail to become a person by failing to develop the manifestation of significant capacities. Also, for a human being to lose the manifestation of these capacities for some reason is to be a human being who has now failed to remain a person. Perhaps only very young and healthy human in infants, while not yet being persons, can be said to be human beings who, at least in what we are willing to say about them, while not being persons, do not fail to be persons. Because again, we expect that if everything goes right, they will become persons. I don't think this kind of moralism can give an adequate account of the obligations we have toward young, healthy infants. At best, all it can do is ground those obligations in a projection of our wants and desires as parents, members of social and political communities, upon these young infants. On this account, we want this human being to become a person to which we will bear significant obligations after the transition. So looking forward to that transition, we project backwards onto these human beings' care and concern for them, a care and concern that is only justified in terms of what they are not now, but may become if we care for them now. Why we want these, this for these animals is anyone's business, and certainly not required of us as a moral obligation directed toward persons. It is an expression of what we want, what we hope for out of our efforts. So much the worse for the cognitively impaired. For not only are they not persons on this account, but the hope of them becoming what we, as parents or society, want and value is inver inversely proportional to the severity of their impairment. The appropriate attitude here is not one of a hope for success, but of mourning for our lack of successful achievement in producing what we want from our reproductive activity or society getting what it wants in terms of future members and, uh, members and citizens. So we kill and we try again, and society encourages us to do so. However, even if one grants this projectivist account of obligations toward the very young and healthy human animal, there's at least some cognitive dissonance in it. Before the transition to personhood, there are no moral facts determined by the existence of these infants other than the values we project upon them as our children, belonging to us like property. If I value my car, I project a value upon it and I will take care of it. If I don't, I won't. If given its values, society wants, uh, sorry, that's part I cut. 
Before the transition to personhood, I may not value my healthy infant child, but for society, for its own wants and desires, requires that I care for it, projecting a value upon me because of a value society has projected upon it. But somehow, after the transition to personhood, everything appears to flip from a moral and political perspective. Now the obligations are thought not to be projections of parental and social values, but rather determined by the moral dignity of the person to which we are now obliged to respond in certain ways, obliged whatever our own values happen to be. What was property, a sign of our material success or failure, to be dealt with as we will, becomes a person with dignity, a self, to which the notion of property is thought to be an affront. What happened? Ex nihilo, as it were, young human beings go from having value as an expression of their, of their parents' dignity, the fulfillment of the goals, wants, and desires for parental success, to being good in, in and through themselves. The good that they are now, that they now are, in themselves is now the basis for a moral condemnation of their parents' values. If they do not reorient them away from a self-interested concern for their own dignity and toward a response to their child's own personal dignity. One struggles to avoid calling this flip of moral perspective uh, moral magic, indeed metaphysical magic. I, pro I propose to think of persons in a related but different way. There's an element of truth in the view we've been canvassing when it emphasizes the capacity for reason and will as involved in the notion of a person. But the moral dissonance arises out of magical thinking that refuses to take seriously the metaphysical and moral reality of the manifestation of significant cognitive capacity as a stage of development in the life of an individual of a certain kind. It treats person as if it were a term for an abstract univocal kind unto itself, rather than as a family resemblance term potentially applied to very different kinds of things engaged in very different forms of life. It assumes that if a lion could talk, we could understand perfectly well what it is saying, the thinking behind much of the fantasies of Walt Disney. The definition of person we have been speaking of runs aground because it speaks ambiguously of a being in, a person is a being that exhibits significant capacities for reason and will. There's at least one ambiguity in the notion of being used in the definition, namely whether we mean an individual simply or whether we mean rather a kind of being. The reasoning we've been considering takes it in the sense of an individual simply, which is more clearly expressed with the word thing, as in a thing that exhibits significant capacities for reason and will. But if that is what is meant by a being, namely a thing or individual, it's not as if this moral reasoning escapes the notion of a kind lurking in the background. What is playing the role of a kind for it is the notion of person specified as exhibiting significant cognitive capacity without reference to the nature of more fundamental kinds of things that can have the nature of a person. But because person plays the role of a kind, we might think gods, angels, dolphins, chimpanzees, Humans and even Martians, it's a philosophy talk, so we have to talk about Martians, uh, may all fit within the, that abstract kind. Whatever other kinds of things they are, namely gods, angels, dolphins, humans, and Martians. But this sense of being, at, of being as individual leaves it mysterious why it is that gods, angels, dolphins, and human beings, and so on, can all be one kind of thing, persons, while still being such different kinds of things. Consider angels. Do ang I'm a Thomist, so we have to talk about angels. Consider angels. Do angels become persons? Do angels become persons like human beings seem to do in this way of thinking? If not, why not? In the case of the human being, becoming a person is possible because of the other nature the individual has, namely uh, human nature. Rocks don't become persons. By contrast, being a person is just something an angel seems to be, not something it becomes. As far as we know, angels aren't born of other angels and don't go through stages of physical development characteristic of animal life like human beings do. But if being a person in the human case is existentially and metaphysically dependent as a stage of development, 
upon the nature of being a human animal, how can person be the same kind in an angel and in a human being? In existential reality, we have quite different kinds of personhood. On the other hand, the notion of being in a being with significant cognitive capacity could just as well express the notion of a kind of thing rather than an individual. Instead of being an additional nature possessed by an individual, being a person is simply a more specific expression of the more fundamental nature in view. So one might offer a new definition of person as a person is an individual substance of a rational nature. This definition is both like and unlike the definition we've been considering. It's like the earlier definition in its reference to the notion of reason. It's also like it in using the notion of an individual. However, it's unlike it in the use of the notions of substance and nature. I don't want to spend much time with the notion of substance in this new definition. It marks a contrast with what we might call individual accidents or individual features of something, like the color of its skin or the mass of its body or the relation to this set of parents rather than that set, and so on. The substance is what has these individual features. There's an important difference marked by putting individual substance in the definition of person. Because by doing so, we are ruling out that the notion of person involves an accident that a substance would have, rather than what a substance is. It excludes precisely the position of the former definition in which being a person is an accident of whatever individual has it. Because the moralist we've been looking at considers being a person an accident of an individual, he can maintain on his definition that there are human beings who aren't persons, just as we have human beings who aren't white. So the difference between the two definitions is clear, because on this new definition, the individual person just is the individual substance. To be a person is just to be a substance of a certain sort. It isn't an accident of the substance. It's the way the substance exists in any sense at all. So this definition of person speaks of a rational nature rather than a rational capacity, as the first definition had. And the difference between rational capacity and rational nature is crucial for determining whether there can be failed persons. I fear this has been too abstract just now. What is meant by nature in the new definition? I just said a moment ago that to be an individual substance is to be of a nature specified as a kind, although I may have actually cut that. Consider cats. There's the nature of a species of feline that we try to de define in biology, supposing that feline is either a lion, a tiger, a jaguar, or the breeds of the animals we claim to have domesticated when we speak of house cats. We think there's something to be classified here, and we can call what we are classifying the nature of the feline. In the case of a human person, we say that human nature is defined as rational animal. What matters to an adequate understanding of the nature of a particular kind of animal is how the very general similarities shared with other sorts of animals, along with differences, come together as a distinct unity of expressed activity in the world. For example, we should acknowledge that other animal species engage in complex mating behavior. That's the similarity. But then look at how that mating behavior differs as well in ways specific to the natures of those kinds of animals. Canines go into heat and act pretty straightforwardly. A woman enters into the fertile stage of her cycle, but rather than acting pretty straightforwardly, at least sometimes this entering into fertility raises serious questions about the good of sexuality and the bearing of children for a man and a woman to reflect upon and consider before acting. And then beyond the phenomenon of reflection upon action for the man and the woman, look also at wedding feasts among human beings living in society. It's a complex social mating behavior of animals, living in a society that points toward the mating behavior of the individuals involved that will follow it, and beyond the mating behavior as courtship that preceded the feast. Why? In a way, the feast is the societal culmination of the mating behavior of the individuals who will become sexually involved that in its social character also transcends the individuals involved and is a public good and understood to be so. This aspect of human sexuality isn't just a difference of degree from other animals. It's a difference of kind. The human community comes together to celebrate the public importance of private sexual acts in a highly complex celebratory social form. Why? 
presumably because through the reflection of reason upon sex and human life, there's a social recognition of the importance of private sexual acts in human, uh, to the ongoing existence and good of the public community, and a celebration of those private sexual acts that understands and wills them as good, not simply for the individuals involved, but for the community itself as more than the individuals. In general, human activity differs from similar activities found in other animals because of the way reason and desire structured by reason inform human activity as the intelligible structure manifests within it. Not just the reason of individuals, but the common reasoning of a society. So in the human case, we have to acknowledge that reason and will play a very significant role in reflecting upon understanding and willing the goods involved in animal life, a life that is intrinsically social. In that respect, reason is not an accidental add-on to our kind of life as animals, as it appears to be in the earlier definition, a mere accident that some of us possess, separating us from the beasts, providing for another form of life, a non-animal form of life. No, it is rather the specific form of our kind of beastly life. It isn't just that animal life is intelligible within us. We already knew that from the study of lions and tigers and bears, that the lives of animals display intelligibility. What is of interest now is that the intelligibility of our life, our animal life, is the result of the animal's own understanding of its animal nature and willing the goods of that animal nature as understood, giving that specific form to what we do as animals. Yes, reason distinguishes us, but it does not distinguish us from animals. It distinguishes us as animals. And it does not distinguish individuals as such. On the contrary, it only distinguishes individuals insofar as it distinguishes the kind to which they belong, rational animal as an existential unity of activity. That's why rational is not a distinct kind that is added up on top of the animal kind the person happens to be. What the contemporary definition, a being that exhibits significant capacities for reason and will, attempts to do is specify a kind on the basis of a capacity rather than a nature. What it ignores is that capacities are not free floating, but are determined by the natures of the individuals that have those capacities. Yes. Almost all kinds of animals have a capacity to reproduce, but the actual capacities they have are specified by the natures they are. The capacity to reproduce as a cat is different from the capacity to reproduce as a worm, is different from the capacity to reproduce as a human being. Similarly for reason, it may be that there are other animals with a capacity to reason or reason like, as there are other animals with a capacity to reproduce. I don't know. But if we want to understand them as persons, we have to understand their capacity to reason in relationship to the distinct natures they express, their form of life. Reason can only be predicated at best by analogy, not univocally, among different kinds, while person in turn, in its turn, will not mean the same thing when applied to a dolphin as it does when applied to a human being, any more than it does when applied to a god. So in asking whether there can be failed persons, we have to ask what kinds of persons are we talking about? Gods, angels, dolphins? For ease, let's confine ourselves to human persons. What would it be to be a failed human person on the new definition? A person is an individual substance of a rational nature. Now we have to understand the capacity to reason as expressive of a particular nature. So we have to think more seriously about human nature. I said that nature as it appears in this new account of person is what we specify when we give a definition. However, what the abstract feature of definitions, including this better one, can hide from us is that the thing defined, the nature, is the intrinsic principle of the specific characteristics of some individual substance's existence. These characteristics are not imposed upon it from the outside, but are rather expressed from within. This aspect of the nature of an individual substance is most easily seen in the case of material substances, the sorts of things we are most familiar with, and even more so in human beings as material substances. The definition is abstract and static. The nature defined is concrete and dynamic. In material substances, a nature is the internal principle of the characteristic stages of development 
that the substance proceeds through in its maturation, but also its decline. It is characteristic of material substances, particularly living material substances, that they develop over time from states of lacking certain features to states of possessing those features. Sometimes the features acquired and possessed come from some agent acting upon the material substance, like putting a collar on one's dog or cutting its hair. But what is significant about living material substances that marks them out as of a certain nature is the characteristics they acquire and come to possess in virtue of principles of development within the substance rather than from some external agent. For example, the shape of the neck of the Labrador upon which we place the collar, or the growth of his hair that we seek to clip arises from within the dog. More significantly still, the capacity to metabolize food and acts of nutrition, the capacity to reproduce, the capacity to move coming from within the animal, and in the human case, the manifestation of the capacity to reason. These capacities are generally developmental stages in the life of an animal of a certain sort of nature. They give expression to the nature that precedes them and upon which they depend. An existing nature of a living material substance is not a principle of stasis. It is a principle, rather, of dunamis, the inner impetus or principle of movement toward the achievement of distinctive goals, or, or sorry, of a distinctive goal or goals. So the different ways in which material substances develop give expression to the different natures that drive the development from within. One doesn't understand what is meant by the nature of a substance. If concentrating on the abstract character of a definition, one misses this inner dynamism. So once we've acknowledged that the nature of living material substances involves processes of development, two things become clear. First, the definition we give of the nature of a substance may in its abstraction hide this dynamic character from us. Rational animal is further defined as a substance characterized by growth, nutrition, reproduction, and reason. But the manifestations of such characteristic capacities arise developmentally in the life of the human animal. They aren't in that respect logically necessary and sufficient conditions. Consider again reproduction. The definition of anything living will involve the capacity to reproduce. And yet there are living individuals without the capacity to reproduce. For instance, mules and young human children. Other human beings who suffer from an injury or an impairment may not have this capacity. And yet, even though the capacity to reproduce is not present for some reason, we have no reason for concluding that the human being involved is not a living thing, because we can give an account in terms of human nature as to why the capacity is not manifest. My 11-year-old son is alive, despite having for now, a def uh, despite, uh, sorry, my 11-year-old son is alive despite lacking for now a defining characteristic of living things, the capacity to reproduce. Second, and related to the first, the definition may hide from us the reality of the goal-driven development characteristic of living material substances, goals determined by the natures in play. Capacities are capacities for, capacities for actual operations or states. The etymological notion of a nature, in Latin natura, is not simply to be born, a static event at a particular time, but to be born to, born to run, born to sing, born to love. If in fact, uh, um, if in fact hidden in the abstract definition of the dynamic nature of a living substance is a goal for an individual with that nature to develop in a certain way, then we can speak of success or failure as the kind of thing one is. For a living being of a material nature, to be this sort of thing is to be aiming at that sort of goal. Success and failure require that the nature one possesses be born to something that one is not yet when born. It may seem odd that in order to be a failure at something, you already have to be it. But that is what it is to have a dynamic nature. Consider games. This woman is a chess player and a successful one. She can't be success a successful chess player without already being a chess player. Consider this man, he's a tennis player and a failed one, but he can't be a failed tennis player without already being a tennis player. This fact about games has to do with there being dynamic realities with goals. Like games, if there can be failed persons, we must grant that they must first be persons, and that person is a dynamic notion, at least in its ordinary context of use. So let's think about what would constitute being a failed human person. 
With this new definition of person, we can no longer say, as with the old, that any human is not a person. Every human being is a person, a human person. To be a human person is to be an individual of a certain nature, human nature, a nature characterized by the development of certain capacities over time, in particular the capacity to manifest reason and, de and desire. It's not necessary that the manifestation of the capacity to reason actually be present in, at any particular time. Not manifesting the capacity to reason, and not, indeed not being able to for some reason, is no more an impediment to being a human person than is lacking the capacity to reproduce an impediment to being a living animal, an 11-year-old living animal, my son. If you are going to say that my two-month-old daughter is not a person because she cannot manifest the capacity to reason, you must also say that my 11-year-old son is not alive. On the contrary, an individual of a nature can lack one or more of the capacities that develop from that nature and still be a member of the kind specified by that nature. Let's consider then the three groups of human beings that did not count as persons for the metaphysics of morals we looked at earlier. First, very young, human, very young human beings who have not yet developed the manifestation of the capacity to reason. On the new definition, they are in fact persons because they are individual substances of human nature, which is a rational nature. Second, very old human beings who have lost the manifestation of the capacity to reason in any significant sense. They are persons because they are individual substances of human nature like the very young. But third, what about human beings who have suffered some catastrophic injury to the conditions necessary for the manifestation of their capacity to reason, never to regain them? Or those born with severe impairments such that they have not and very likely will not ever manifest the capacity? Unless one is willing to say that they are not individual substances of human nature, they are persons, human persons. And of course, one must say that they are individual substances of human nature because their injuries or impairments of reason only count for them as injuries or impairments given the rational human nature they possess. You can't injure an oak tree's capacity to reason. A worm cannot be born with a severe cognitive impairment. So on the account of personhood and dignity I've been developing, all human beings are persons and have the dignity of persons. No matter the stage of their development as human beings, their injured status as human beings, or their impairments as human beings. Still, we can ask who among the human persons that there are might be failed persons, if any. How does a person fail? One might be tempted to think that precisely because they are persons, those human beings who do not manifest the capacities are the failed persons. But that would be a mistake. Because human person is personhood is dynamic, success or failure as a person has to be understood with respect to the goals pursued by persons through their doings and their actions. But there are many goals human beings pursue and achieve that are not expressions of their reality as persons. The beating of the heart, the pumping of the lungs, the digestion of food in the gut. Human beings achieve goals here without it being the case that those achievements are pursued precisely because they are persons. On the other hand, there are goals human beings pursue precisely because they are persons. Walking to the store, uh, making love to their wives or husbands, worshiping God. These are achievements that give expression to the reality of being a person because they proceed from the capacity to understand the goals involved and to put order into the pursuit of them precisely because of what is understood to be good about them and their relationship to one another. On the anniversary of my wedding, I make dinner for my wife and kids and we exchange gifts as an act of memory of our vows to one another and as an ongoing symbolic expression of and commitment to those vows as remembered and understood to be good. That is just one way in which success at being a human person is achieved. I fail if I bring reason and will to bear upon it in such a way that I do not achieve the goods I have set my sights upon. But such success doesn't just presuppose my being a person because I am a human being. It presupposes, in addition, my being able to bring the capacities of reason and will to bear upon the achievement of what I'm doing. If I'm prevented from, if I cannot bring reason and will to bear upon those goals for some reason, then I don't fail. I'm a person who for some reason cannot pursue the goals of a person. I'm a person who neither, neither succeeds nor fails. That may seem paradoxical, but again, consider a chess player prevented from playing chess. 
Would we say she failed to play chess if, for example, someone stole her board, or she was called away by the sickness of her child, or she was knocked unconscious? As a chess player, she is prevented from playing as a chess player, but she hasn't failed. So the very young human being, the very old, the severely impaired are all persons, but they are not failed persons because precisely as persons, they are prevented for various reasons from acting as persons. To fail as a person, you have to be able to act as a person and not be prevented from doing so. So who then might be failed persons if not the very young, the very old, and the severely impaired persons around us? Well, there are many goals we pursue as persons. I want, however, to focus upon one feature of the lives of human persons that is necessary to any success as persons. The definite, uh, definition appears to stress that a person is an individual, but hidden in the rational nature part of the definition is the fact that human nature is inherently social because it involves the lives of animals. Specifically, as animals, we are social in part because of the ways in which we depend upon one another for the achievement of the goals that we have as human beings. It is almost impossible to think of an activity we engage in as persons that does not involve dependence upon other human beings for its accomplishment, however much its accomplishment may most properly belong to an individual. From the food we eat, to the disciplines we study, to the games we play, the sidewalks we walk upon, or the nature reserves we amble through, to the wives and husbands we marry, to the children we raise, to what have you, a clear-sighted vision of reality requires that we acknowledge our dependence upon others for what we achieve and for our success. And because in acting with one another as persons to achieve these goals, we bring reason to bear upon those goals and will, and will them as understood to be socially embedded, we can properly describe this as a life of friendship and solidarity with one another. Friendship and solidarity precisely in our dependence upon one another in our weakness and our vulnerability, not despite it. In particular, if I am right, just as we are persons because we are human, we are also friends because we are human. Being a friend to other human beings is no more a choice we make than is being a person. Who is my neighbor? Who is my friend? The answer to those questions is not determined by our choice, but by our nature as persons. We do not choose our friends. We respond to them or fail to do so. And forgive me, Your Eminence, if you're still here, I'm inclined to deny that there is a preferential option for the poor any more than there is an option to be a person. Like being a person, being a friend is something we can succeed or fail at because the friendship we are born to finds expression through actions that involve the understanding of reason and will. So perhaps the most important question concerning success or failure as a person involves not how we act towards the friends we choose to love, but the friends we are born to love. Moral reasoning that concludes to the possibility of killing the weak, the vulnerable, and dependent is moral reasoning that aims at the destruction of natural human friendship and solidarity. When we act to destroy the weak, the vulnerable, and dependent among us, we act to destroy our friends. In so doing, we act to destroy the possibility for our success as persons. Yes, there are failed persons. To pursue the dynamism of our nature is to understand that friendship, that, that friendship that constitutes us as human, and to address it through our willed actions. There are failed persons because there are human beings who fail to help those who are in need, particularly the most dire need. These failed persons are human beings who use their reason and will to ignore, avoid, or distract themselves from the sufferings of other human beings. So if you are looking to see who they are amongst us, look for the persons who fail to express human friendship and solidarity with dependent, weak, and vulnerable persons. We fail as friends when we do not acknowledge our union with them and assist them. There is more we are born to in human friendship and being a person than this, but it is at least this. Looking for failed persons, we should not go looking among the very old and the severely impaired. We should look in the mirror and ask whether we see persons who are friends to these other human persons. The greatest, most successful human friendship is the friendship that gives the most help to those persons most in need because it has used its reason and will to acknowledge that it is already bound 
to these persons in their need, already bound to them by nature. In conclusion, what I've tried to suggest is that when thinking about failed persons, when one looks in the mirror, one will only see a successful person living up to the dignity of the image of God if one has learned to recognize that image first in one's natural friends, the weak, the vulnerable, the severely impaired, the suffering, all those friends who do not count as persons in much of contemporary philosophical thought. There is a dignity to being a human person unknown to the metaphysics of morals. It is the dignity of misericordia, which, and now I will mention Aquinas, Aquinas tells us is the expression of friendship and the greatest of all virtues because the most godlike. A failed person whose face, a failed person is a person whose face is not the face of misericordia. Thank you for listening.